Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the effect of wind on the ocean. Now the first thing I've got to say though is I activated 3D view for like a nice little like kind of visual here and I've got a ghost ship and I'm kind of spooked about it and it must have something to do with that patch they released recently, but it's all good. So what's the big deal with this? So as you know, uh, wind affects bomb accuracy, it affects a lot of different things, you know, obviously if you are a crew on a SAM site and you're trying to use some kind of Doppler filtering, if it gets nice and windy, it actually makes it easier to detect enemy targets because now you're getting Doppler noise everywhere and you can kind of filter it out but for us we're going to be interested in the winds impact on sea state and detection now what's going on here well for those of you not familiar with the Beaufort scale is basically a scale between I believe 0 and 12 that's going to describe what the water conditions are like now in the real world of course as things start to get wavier they start to have an increased number, amount of noise that makes it more difficult to use sonar so to demonstrate this so we've got a pretty straightforward little simulation here we have the USS Haynes uh, for those of you who saw that movie with Robert Robert Mitchum, you get a gold star. I'm not going to give it away, but you can go look it up. Amazing movie, by the way, for those of you who get a chance for that one. Or we're two. Um, we're going to go ahead and try to find a couple of Russian submarines here. And right now, as you can see, the weather conditions are super stupendous. I would pop up here and edit real quick and we go bop over to weather. You'll see that shh, it's as calm as it can get. So I'm going to go ahead and close this guy out. I'm going to go ahead and speed up time a little tiny bit here. And we're just going to kind of cruise around in the OSS Haynes. And we've detected something. Aha! Let's see here. We've got a goblin. Uh, this is from the Ann Square. The square, I believe, is our toad array, which it is. has a toad array only. And we have an estimated distance of 14.1 nautical miles. Whoop, getting closer. Getting closer. All right, we're going to go 12.4 nautical miles and 9.1 nautical miles. Starting to get a little closer. Getting closer and... Uh, Let's call it about, I don't know, so 8.3 nautical miles, I think is a pretty fair estimate. If we actually flip on normal mode, you'll notice, yeah, we're, we're pretty much right on. However, we have not detected this submarine, which is in my little visible square here. It's okay, though. I know how this scenario plays out. Oh, there he is. And then suddenly we detect the second goblin, also by the square, at a distance of 5.9 nautical miles. Again, that's estimated. If you actually take a look, we picked them up pretty much right on the edge here. And again, these are both the two same submarines. Now, you're sitting here saying, well, uh, how is it that you're able to pick up one submarine before the other, even though they're the exact same kind of sub? Well, it has to do with the depth. Uh, this chap right here is substantially deeper than this chap here. So the toad array system, which is dangling into the water, is basically listening underneath and is able to not be affected by the surface sound. Keep in mind right now, we have no nasty sea. We have basically glass for ocean. So as you can see, we have no difficulty in acquiring both of them. He's quite a bit more shallow, so he's going to be a little more difficult to detect until the last second here. So we're going to go ahead and reset the scenario. I'm going to go a little reset. I'm going to press testa. Of course, yes, I name everything the same deal. I'm going to come in here and we're going to recreate the scenario, but we're going to do this time is we're going to make the weather terrible. So now we are in hurricane force winds, which now means the waves are going to be doing this, and there's going to be white caps, and there's going to be white horses and spray, and my entire crew be utterly incapacitated. Speaking of utterly incapacitated, believe it or not, there is a maximum sea state in each one of these ships. At this time, uh, the ship's operations are not impacted by it, which is actually interesting because at sea state six and seven, your crew would be spending more time throwing up than they would be spent doing anything else on their boat itself. Another thing that's kind of interesting is if I actually press F6 here, I've got two sea sprites ready to rock. If we grab one of these and at launch, he says, okay, I'll be in the air in 30 seconds. Um, at Sea State 9, you can't launch or recover helicopters. Uh, that's just kind of one of those little quirky things. But there is something that is very, very well modeled with an extreme Sea State like this. All right, there goes my helicopter. You are the best helicopter pilot in existence. Way to go ahead and uh, land in this condition here. So let's go back to my Hanes here and we'll continue cruising. And let's see what happens uh, when we bump into that. To, uh, and look at that. We've got one right away. Now, as you probably expect, this is probably going to be the one that's deep, and you would be correct. Notice that we picked them up instead of at 14 nautical miles, we picked them up at 11 nautical miles. But I'll actually go ahead now, let some TMA analysis kick in here. Getting closer, oh, there we go. About 9.3. So we've had a significant reduction in detection range of a target that is very, very, very deep, which is actually kind of surprising. Again, this would be the task. Yeah, it is the task that did it. Now, watch this. So we're cruising, we're cruising, we're doing our little thing, you know, um, Robert Mitchum's doing his whole little speech and asking the guy in the, the uh, depth charges, he's saying, oh, what were you before the war? And the guy's like, oh, I was a clockmaker, but the depth charge crushed my fingers. Um, like I said, very nice movie, a um, very cool movie if you have not seen it. Great submarine tactics also. So we picked him up at 5.4 nautical miles is when we're more confident of him. His actual position is substantially not 5.4 nautical miles away. As a matter of fact, he's, uh, rip, let's measure that real fast, about 7.4 nautical miles away. So we're having some ambiguity created because of the sea conditions. So we're going to get another problem. I'll go ahead and unpause here and I'll just kind of keep cruising. Oh, we picked up somebody else. Uh, estimated range on him is 
3.7 nautical miles. Now, if you remember the first time, we picked them up right around 6.4. So our effective detection range for a shallow target has not been quite halved. I think it's about 40%. I, I did this in a chart one time. And you can see as we start to rectify this a little bit better and um, again, do some quick TMA, we're able to identify him a little bit further out to about 5.8 nautical miles. So you can see that this has a substantial effect on our ability to detect a subsurface target. Also notice the target that is deeper, which is farther away from the waves that are crashing above our heads. I hate it when it does that, by the way. Um, we are much, much able, uh, better able to precisely identify where it is and detect it soon versus the other one, which is closer to the surface where the noise of the waves crashing is interfering with our ability to safely detect it. So you can see that it does have an interesting impact. So when you're planning operations, one of the things you can take into account now is if I'm uh, of noisier water, I'll have an easier time of hiding and vice versa. Of course, um, I really wish I had some um, depth charges on this thing. I could have a, quite a party here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, by the way, one of the fun things to do as a destroyer, <laughs> this whoop this is my favorite thing to do is to destroy you go right between the two subs and then you do one of these guys uh let's see here you get two of these and you get two of these so because you have tubes on both sides you go thunk, 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 on both sides that's a technical sound by the way so watch this so they go bam 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 left right left right left right. i don't know it's, it's just so satisfying to do on um, one of those uh oh i have a perry frigates so um, let's see how we do here. So these two, what's going to happen is this guy's going to start running as fast as he can. So we got to go actually take a really, really aggressive turn here because he will pop a torpedo right into us. So we have to get our decoy ready. And boom, we got one. This guy's on the run. Come sneak up on him. Uh-oh, it's coming around in front of the pass. Surprise! Thought you could outrun my torpedo. That's one. And let's see how we do here. These are, what is this, a Mark 46? Oh, yeah, you're not outrunning that. Come get some. He's really right here. The reason he looks like he's here is this is the last time we heard him, but then the noise of the tor 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 torpedo propellers, try saying that 10 times fast, has blocked us. Oh, that did it. Ha <laughs> ha, one, two. Wow, four for four. So hopefully this video is interesting. Like I said, um, if we were to experiment with this a little more, I could show you how bombing is affected by wind. Obviously, as it gets windier, non-guided bombs have a really tough time reliably hitting the targets. But we'll save that for another week. Other than that, enjoy.